Hello, welcome to the Sanford Museum. I'm Brigitte Stevenson, the curator, and I'm here over with these two portraits of Nehemiah Curtis Sanford and Nancy ba ba Bateman Shelton Sanford. These two got married in 1822, and less than a year later, they got to have Henry Shelton Sanford, who were celebrating their 200th birthday. To give a little bit about who these people were, Nancy was originally from Derby, Connecticut. She came from a shipping family. And this is Nehemiah. He came from a merchant background. They got married in Woodbury, Connecticut, which is a few hours outside of Derby, Connecticut. Um, eventually they would move and make the homestead, which Henry Sanford would kind of live back and forth in his life for most of his life over in Derby, Connecticut. So to kind of talk about how did one celebrate a birth in 1823? After all, we are celebrating Henry Sanford's birthday. Well, back then they didn't really do birthdays for children. That wasn't a thing really until the mid part of the 19th century. But a lot of the times they would celebrate the actual birth. The most famous of this is if you were Christian, you would have the christening or the baptism. That is when the child would kind of officially come out to be announced. Now there was a little bit of a party that was done beforehand. This was done by all women. You see, giving birth is a, excuse the pun, laborious process. Um, and actually it was very risky at this time period as well. Modern medicine, especially modern woman's medicine, wasn't really being studied until the later part of the 19th century. And not only that, we know that it was a risky endeavor. Every time you had a child, you were more likely to die in childbirth, um, and that like percentage would raise 20% each time you had a child in that time period. So Nancy went through it to have Henry Sanford. We don't know the exact details of Henry Sanford's birth. We do know that he was an only child for the rest of his life. Um, so Nancy would probably be recouping at this time period. Women tended to be on bed rest for 20 to like 60 days, depending on how hard the pregnancy was for the woman. But there was this period of time that she wouldn't have to be lonely the whole time. It wasn't like she was going mad with yellow wallpaper, uh, that she would invite her friends for a cake and coddle. Coddle is probably not something you should be drinking after giving birth, but at this time period, it was viewed very medicinal. It's essentially alcoholic gruel. And I'll get into a little bit more about what that is later. This was done where she can invite her closest friends or her mother or even her mother-in-law. It was whoever she wanted. In fact, many etiquette guides of the time period discuss, don't be offended if she doesn't invite you. You know, it's up to who she wants to help her during this time. So women would come together and they would make cake in this medicinal gruel um, to give to, to the mother so she could raise her strength until she was ready to do the christening. Now, you may be wondering if you're not Christian or you are Christian um, and you don't know, is there a difference between a baptism and a christening? Well, yes and no. Nowadays, not really. Even the church is like, it's the same thing. But in Victorian etiquette guides, and this is a little bit before Victorian, um, they say that there is a difference. A baptism is just the rite that, that happens, so it is considered like a very holy rite to have happened to you, especially because in a lot of Christian religions, they believe that you cannot go to heaven unless you are baptized. So if the child was sickly when it first came out, they might have been baptized immediately without the whole fanfare in order to make sure that their soul can go to heaven. Um, but a christening, if the child was healthy enough, it would be both the baptism and kind of the announcement. Um, in it, they would get their godparents uh, as well. These were people who were supposed to step up if anything happened with the parents. Again, this is showing these notions that, you know, at this time period, death was prevalent in many different ways and showing that there would be certain protections for the child if anything were to happen. Now, luckily, Henry Sanford did not need that. Um, unfortunately, he did lose his father when he was 18. So fairly young uh, that we would think of now, and he lost his father to tuberculosis. So I'm gonna show you how to make exactly a coddle and what is it, a coddle, I'm sorry, and what is it? And I would like to, for you guys to come with me. So we're gonna do a quick change. And we're back. I'm here showing some of the ingredients that I'm gonna use for my own coddle recipe. With any old recipe, it takes a little bit about, of guesswork. And I'm gonna explain my reasoning why I chose the ingredients that I chose. 
Now the main component of coddle is gruel, an unappetizing word that you've had before. If you've had crits, if you've had oatmeal, those are essentially gruel. So in this case, I chose quick cook steel cut oats, mainly because the consistency is pretty fine. I saw in one recipe that you want it to be based the consistency of polenta. Um, so I thought this would be best. Even with this one, I feel like it can be ground down a little bit more. So I'll be taking my motor and pestle um, and trying to grind that down a little bit. The other reason why I chose this is even though one recipe said that some people use grits for their coddle, um, that Nancy is from New England. So I feel like her gruel would probably be more oat based instead. It wouldn't be unheard of of somebody up north having grits, but it would make more sense to the region that she'd be having oats. Now the other probably most unique component, especially because we do not associate this with people who've recently given birth, is white wine. And when I say white wine, it led me onto a research of which white wine, because there's so many different types of white wines. There's Chardonnays, there's Pinot um, Grigios, uh, there's Rieslings. What exactly are we looking at? So I chose a Riesling mainly because I kind of looked into some research about what was the white wine at the time being grown. I saw in a couple things that they discussed on their vineyards that they were growing uh, Rhinish um, grapes, uh, which basically means that it comes from the Rhine, which kind of starts doing it. I also vaguely thought that this might be a sweet wine because one of the substitutions called for brandy, which is a sweeter fortified wine. So I thought that also may be a possibility. I finally hit jackpot when I found in a paper, it was discussing how a vineyard gave as a gift to the governor of Pennsylvania in 1813, a white wine and the governor declared it tastes like an old hawk. Um, an old hawk is a term that we don't use anymore. It's a hawk. It's an English specific term to describe a white wine from the Hockheimer region. And sorry if I butchered that for any of you Germans. Uh, and they grow Riesling. So I was able to find this wine that is from that area. So I think this is the closest. There may have been some other white wines, especially grown in the United States that are similar. Um, I just thought this one was my safest bet. And Nancy and um, Nehemiah did come from some wealth. They were upper middle class at this time. This is before Nehemiah gets his factory and really gains his wealth. And he was a merchant, so he may have had some access to something like that. So. And again, I'm not 100% sure, and if there's somebody in the comments who would like to correct me, please do, because we're all here to learn. Now, you would also have a lemon peel and nutmeg. Nutmeg is used a whole lot in this time period with its cooking. Now, you also have another uh, ingredient called, sorry if I butcher this, capillar, uh, which you don't see as much anymore. Um, it was viewed as very medicinal. Basically, it is a simple syrup with this. This is called maidenhair fern. You can still buy it. You basically make a simple syrup, which is you take equal parts water and equal parts sugar. Uh, this is the sugar that I got. In this time period, sugar also wanna be like this fine powdered white sugar. It tended to come in cones. Um, so I found this to be kind of more similar to, to what was probably the sugar that they had back then. And a little bit of orange blossom water. Now, orange blossom water uh, is made by uh, soaking orange blossoms in water for a period of time and then straining them out. Uh, this is actually really popular still to this day in Middle Eastern cuisine. You'll especially see it in baking. In this case, it's making a simple syrup. There was a recipe for coddle in the 1840s that actually takes out the alcoholic parts and only uses that capillar as, as kind of the substitute for that. To me, that indicates maybe that's part of the temperance movement that started was going at that time period, kind of moving away. 1820, you have to remember, is right before we reach the zenith of American drinking, which is the 1830s, where that is the most we ever drank. So alcohol was a huge part of life. It was not only for celebration, but in this case, it was viewed as medicinal, helping the mother regain her energy and ready to take on the day. Now, we don't do that, of course. Science has proven that's probably not the best otherwise. I'm not a doctor again, but if you wanna try something similar, you can try it with the capillar without the white wine. Other recipes have also had it with brandy and even mixing both brandy and white wine. 
I've also seen it that they have an ale for one who is very sick uh, and cannot stomach it and that they suggest doing it ale instead. So I'm going to try making this and I'll let you know how it turns out and I'll come back. Okay, and here we have it, our caudal. Now, caudal were actually had a specific glass, usually silver, where it had two handles and a little, little top to keep it warm. In this case, I'm just using a teacup. It was traditional that you would also have a long spoon to eat it from. It's not the most interesting looking dish, to say the least. It just looks like oatmeal with some pizzazz. So I'm going to try it, and this is a live reaction, and we have to remember our ancestors' taste was different than our taste today, so I'm going to see. And that's not bad. Like, it just, it tastes like oatmeal, and you really get the taste of the, the nutmeg is the main thing. You have a little bit of um, vegetable notes from the capa pilar or capa pilier, I don't know. Um, I think I could have ground these nuts oats a little bit down a little bit. I think that would have been a little bit better. Can't taste the wine. Um, and then you have the citrus. It's not bad. Um, would I be making this every day? Probably not. Um, I'll be truthful about it. But this was made specifically to be not a completely offensive dish or hard on the stomach to digest. This was made for people who were recovering their strength. So with that, I hope we all learned a little bit about it. And we hope to see you June 10th at the Sanford Museum in celebration of Henry Sanford's 200th birthday. We're going to do a bunch of birthday activities and we can't wait to see you. Bye. This is Nancy Bateman Shelton. She was from a major shipping family, the Sheltons, um, that lived in um, over. Dun, 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 d